Holy shit, like this caught me by surprise. Just took five minutes and 21 seconds for the exact same thing that took one hour and 51 minutes on my old device. This just justified the whole $3,500. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I just spent a pretty dime on a new MacBook, which will save me time, save the planet, but definitely not save any money. This video is sponsored by Motion VFX. So, for those of you who are new to this channel, first of all, hi, I'm Joey Helms, filmmaker, photographer at night, and during the day, I'm a creative director. I'm mostly shooting, okay. Mostly shooting documentary, travel, and commercial content on my red cameras, uh, Sony and drones. I do that usually in the wild, run and gunning, and then I talk about it on this channel. Where is my knife? I need a knife. Luckily, I'm shooting in the kitchen, so there's knives everywhere. And yeah, I've been editing on a 2018 i7 MacBook Pro. Oh, you don't even need a knife. Love Apple's packaging. And an iMac, a 2015 iMac. And honestly, on more complex edits and tasks, they were crapping out on me, costing me time and nerves. So it was time. You gotta love that smell. And in this video, we will have a real world look at this machine, render some stuff in Final Cut Pro, Premiere Pro and Resolve and I will have my live reaction to this block of metal from a filmmaker's perspective so let's see how it goes. Did you hear the sound? All right so let's first address what Apple did here and with its design they went in a different direction from what they usually do. First of all, they listened to the community and brought back fan favorites that they themselves killed off, like the HDMI port, the SD card reader, and my favorite, the MagSafe with its satisfying clicking sound. The cord is now braided, which I absolutely dig, though the cable itself is a little short in my opinion. Hopefully you can buy a longer one at some point. I would definitely get it. Secondly, they went with function over form, which is definitely not normal for Apple. It is quite a bit chunkier than the previous models. And while if you look at the specs, it doesn't appear that much thicker, in reality it is. It is certainly, you see the screen itself is thicker and the design itself is more squared off, making it feel much meatier. I guess it's to put all the power in there while still maintaining a good airflow. And yeah, the keyboard was overhauled. It is now set in this black setting. The touch bar is gone. I'm not someone who is like, the touch bar is the work of the devil. I had not a strong positive or negative feeling about it. I think it was under leverage in most cases. So barely used it, so I'm fine with it being gone. But the, deep, the keys are also deeper. I noticed it when I was typing though it is not as mechanic as they advertised it. This time around, Apple actually gives you many more customization options and the biggest one you possibly have to make is if you wanna go with the M1 Pro or the more powerful M1 Max chip, which is the first generation of Apple's own silicon. Now, I think most people will be fine with the M1 Pro, even if you have heavier grades and effects on it. And for the first time ever, you can get all these configurations in both the 16 inch model, but also in the smaller 14 inch model. Now the question is really, do you want a bigger screen and longer battery life? Because this one is definitely longer. Or do you want a smaller device that is lighter and also costs $200 less? The choice is absolutely yours, but there is an asterisk. Apparently only on the 16 inch M1 Max models, you can access the high power mode, which allows you to get extra performance out of it. But no one has really talked about it from Apple's side. If anyone has the 14 inch M1 Max model, let us know down in the comments below if you can access the high power mode. Who knows? It now boasts a HDR screen with 120 Hz variable refresh rate and a sustained brightness of 1000 nits, which I think is legitimate for video editing and you may not even need a secondary video editing monitor if you don't have one around. You're more than fine with this thing. 
and it actually makes me think if I should switch over to a HDR workflow for my YouTube videos. Overall, the screen got noticeably larger. Yes, it has a notch with a 1080p camera in it. Also, they upgraded the already great speaker system and that is something that really stood out to me that was noticeable. We're an Imperial outpost in name only. When was the last time they even contacted us? A decade ago? They will defend us. We need to do it ourselves. Easy. You have to possibly experience it yourself, but it also support spatial audio which I really got to love from my AirPods Pro. Now enough of the spec and design talk, let's dive into what we're really here for and damn curious about and that's the performance for video editing. And I should say I've not tried it yet myself, I've been waiting for this to have a genuine reaction on tape, so what are we waiting for? As some of you may know, I've been editing in Final Cut Pro for the past six years and MacBooks are and will always be optimized and perform best with Apple's own software. But we will also touch on Premiere Pro and Resolve. Now, one thing that really bugged me with my old laptop and hampered my motivation was how poorly it played back clips in my NLE, especially when it comes to different cameras, different heavier codecs. And it's just not it's just not fun. And the unified GPU and CPU design of the M1 Max and the M1 Pro promises really an upgrade in performance that I really want to see now in real life. So we're looking here now at a clip from the Red V Raptor. It's an 8K Red Code Raw codec clip, an R3D file, and I added two LUTs to it and also a layer of grain. So now, as we are hovering over here already, it looks very smooth. And if I'm just gonna hit play now, I don't think it skips a frame. It's incredibly smooth. And mind you, I'm screen recording and also am in the high quality mode here. High quality, better quality versus better performance. So, awesome. This is certainly something that makes editing so much more fun now. Next, let's look at a Sony Alpha 1 8K clip. I'm just gonna hit play here and it is running buttery smooth, even with the grade and the grain on top of it. Now the ultimate test will be R5 footage. Canon R5 footage is notoriously terrible. If this plays back smoothly, then I would be highly surprised. Drum roll, let's see where there's some movement here. Okay, here we go. It is... It is choppy, you see it. Again, it's not pre-rendered R5 footage. It must be the codec. <laughs> it's definitely struggling. Now, lastly, let's also look at some red Komodo footage because that's what I'm editing most with and shooting with. And if the 8K red Raptor footage works fine, I'm not surprised that this one just goes smoothly as well. Like, I, like, was already worth it. On that note, a real quick thank you to Manny, Peter and Brandon for sending me over some clips from different cameras so we, that we can test them here. But what if we throw them all together? Because Apple is boasting that you can play back seven ProRes 8K clips without any hiccups thanks to their ProRes encoding and decoding media unit that is within this ship. I mean, this is a real test. If this plays back nicely, I'll be surprised because especially because it has R5 footage in it. Let's see how it plays back. Oh boy. Okay. Yeah, you see, you see it's choppy. Okay, we hit the max if we have seven clips of random footage. Now I'm curious if I take out the R5 footage because that could be our culprit here. Here we go. Without the R5 footage, it, everything plays back smoothly. Interesting. Tasks that are always draining on your GPU are graphic elements that I happen to love to use on my videos. And one thing that is particularly taxing on my i7 2018 MacBook Pro are 3D tracking and 3D elements. So for effects, I've been using the Motion VFX plugins for years now, and they were even featured in the launch event of this very laptop. And the most note I am that there is the sponsor of this video today and let us try the M-Tracker 3D to push this laptop a little to its boundaries. Let's see. This is a clip of the Icelandic volcano Fagradatsjatl 
always fun to say. First, we just add here this effect, the M Tracker 3D. Then we just click here on track and it runs its course. And on my i7 MacBook Pro, this took a while. And I can see already here, although we're looking at an over 20 second long clip, it is definitely much faster. Once it is tracked, we select what element we want to put into our scene. I just for illustrative purposes, I'm going to take a 3D text here. Now we need to just copy the track here from our clip to the text element. And then we just have to position and pick the location of our 3D element where we want to anchor it. I'm going to put it here on this side of the mountain because we nicely see it throughout. Okay, we see like we just need to adjust the rotation as well a little bit. You need to always look at it in, in different positions in the 3D space so that it accurately reflects where you want it to be positioned. Et voila, we have a beautiful 3D animation of the Fagradalsfjall name tag. If you are a Final Cut Pro editor, I totally recommend checking out the Motion VFX plugins with a link in the description below. I'm not just saying this because they're sponsoring this video, but I truly believe in their software. I've been using it for years and really dig it. Okay, I'm just gonna throw in a pizza real quick while I'm still adding. I'm getting really hungry. Really dig the spinach pizza, not sponsored. Now one bottleneck that we all encounter, let's face it, is the export and rendering time. So I thought, what if I take all these clips that I now have, like the V-Raptor stuff, the R5, the A1, my Komodo clips, some Sony clips from the drones and GoPro and scale it up to 8K where, where needed and create this five minute long 8K clip, which has two layers of LUTs on it and a grain and see how long it will take to export. Now I did this already on my 2018 i7 MacBook Pro and it took an unbelievable one hour and 50 minutes or 51 minutes to export. This is absolutely insane and with its ship design and dedicated media and ProRes encoders uh, I hope and it promises that the M1 Max should be significantly faster. The question is now how much faster? So now let's export this. Five minutes later. Holy shit, like this caught me by surprise. I was just checking on my pizza, but it like, I don't know if you see this, but let me get around here. It just finished the export and it just took five minutes and 21 seconds for the exact same thing that took one hour and 51 minutes on my old device. It took five minutes and 21 seconds. This is, this is absolutely bonkers. This is why, this is why I got this. This is like, this just justified the whole $3,500 for me because if I can edit and export that much faster now, expect many more videos on my YouTube channel. All right, I need to calm down a little bit, but let's check out some 8K Red Raptor footage and see how it compares on Resolve and Premiere and Final Cut, both on my old device as well as on my new one. So I'm gonna render these real quick here, so I haven't done this yet, and see how much faster that is. Because like, if this thing just took five minutes, they will be done here in seconds. All right, time is running. This is a 30 second long R3D file um, with again, like two LUTs on it and grain. And here we go, 47 seconds. This whole shebang took 47 seconds, which on my old laptop took 15 minutes and 22 seconds. I mean, this old laptop is not spec'd out completely, but this is a stark difference. Like in the rendering, this is blazing fast. Now up it, shh. It's when you live downtown. Now, obviously MacBooks and Final Cut are supposed to run together very well. And now I'm curious how the very same clip compares in its rendering time on Resolve and Premiere Pro. All right, now we're here in Premiere. Let's see how smooth the playback within Premiere is. And yep, no problem. V-Raptor footage, 8K with grade and graining. It's no problem playing back. All right, let's see how long it takes to export this clip in 8K. Same conditions here as for Final Cut Pro. And let's go. My pizza is ready, so... Oh, 
the fans kicked in. So, so people have always wondered like when, at what point the fans kick in. Video is successfully exported. Boom. All right, so it took three minutes, 55 seconds to export it on Premiere Pro. And for comparison, it took an hour and seven minutes on my i7 MacBook Pro. All right. My pizza is ready, but I'm way too curious to figure out what's happening on DaVinci Resolve and how, fa how much faster that is compared to my old MacBook and how it also compares to the other two. Booting up takes a little bit longer for sure. All right, now we are here in Resolve and the, honestly the playback here seems to be very choppy, like not fluid at all. So I don't know if that's something, I'm not a regular Resolve user, so I don't know if there's any way I can fix it. But let's start the render and see how long it will take to get this one out. Many, many minutes later. Now finally Resolve also decided to complete the render within actually 28 minutes and 35 seconds, which is significantly longer than what we've seen in Premiere and Final Cut. Hey, future me here who got a little bit suspicious about the performance of Resolve on these machines. And so I digged around a little bit and tried some things out and turns out that the grain, the native grain within Resolve was the culprit that was bugging down both machines. So I re-ran the render test and turns out my old i7 MacBook Pro took 1724 minutes for uh, that 8K clip and the M1 Max blazed through in three minutes, 52 seconds, just slightly faster than Premiere. So all of you Resolve users, and I know there's a bunch of you editing and grading in the DaVinci, you can be all relieved. It plays back smoothly. The render times are equivalent to Premiere Pro. So whew, let's go back to the studio. Well, but let's throw up the times here just for comparison. You see how crazy fast it is now in Final Cut Pro. It's absolutely amazing. And I think it matches up also very much on Premiere Pro. It's super fast. Now I hope these little real world tests gave you a little bit of an idea of the performance of this machine and if it's a good fit for you as a filmmaker. I personally think so, but you have to address one aspect of it and that's the price. They are expensive, they are very expensive. I paid for mine, the base M1 Max model, $3,499 uh, $3, and that's before tax. Never in my life have I been that excited about a laptop, but also never in my life have I paid that much for a computer. This investment makes sense if you are video editing on a daily basis. Personally, I think if you are just occasionally video editing, the 13-inch M1 model from last year is a much better deal. It clocks in at, I think, $1,399 and you will be happy. You will get really good performance thanks to these new M1 chips. Now in the tech world, this is my personal POV that usually you can skip a generation even if you're working at the pro level. But this laptop, if you compare it to the previous 16 inch MacBook Pro, is really a step up. For me, this means truly buying time because if I can edit faster and more efficiently, I have time to do other things and enjoy my life. If you enjoyed this video, please like it if you loved it. Subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell. There will be many more videos coming out. Many more because possibly I'm more efficient in future. And as always, thanks so much for watching. Have a good morning, have a good night, whenever and wherever you are around this beautiful planet. Bye bye.